Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the February 13th Traffic and Parking Commission meeting. Uh, first of all, before we get started, we'd like to welcome our news member, Captain Raymond Jones with the Metro Police Department. He is head of the Nashville Traffic Division in the Police Department. And uh, uh, so, you know, by charter, the police are part of the commission and they provide valuable insights to the rest of us. So thank you. Welcome, Captain Jones. We'll look forward to working with you. If you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Traffic and Parking Commission, you may file, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the commission's decision. We advise that you seek your own independent legal advice to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. And let's see, before we get started, Teresa, you brought someone who's going to be helping with keeping us safe, keeping us legal. Yes. Is this, is that usually the one we have? Proceeds, but okay, there we go. Um, yes, I would like to introduce Erica Haber. She's a new attorney with my office. Um, she's going to be my teammate and um, assist me in representing the um, commission. So she wanted to come and observe and start learning. So. Right. Well, welcome, Erica. All right. All right. Um, the next item is to look for approval of today's agenda. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. We have a first. Is there a second? We have a first and a second. All in favor? It's approved. The approval of the minutes of the January meeting. Everybody had a chance to look at those? There are a motion to approve. So moved. We have a first. Is there a second? Second. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. All right. The minutes have been approved. We have no items on the consent agenda. So we'll move to our next item, which is uh, 5.01, which is a request for waiver of wider right away permit feeds for load in and load out activities associated with TPAC events through the end of 2024. And Ms. Alicorn is gonna, Director Alicorn is gonna present that. And we have folks from TPAC that are here present. So thank y'all for coming. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. We actually had a chance to visit with TPAC um, last month. Um, as you are aware, they're in the downtown core and they have their parking is a bit challenged. So uh, we had met with them as we are implementing the new smart parking program about some of the condition changes that are going to happen. And this is actually, they came to us and said, this is a little bit of a problem because they've already uh, planned out their season. And in planning out their seasons, they've set rates and they've based that on past practices. So they came to us and they said, is there a way for us to maintain the current practice through this season? And then they'll start immediately um, um, chart putting in the new charging. So now we are, that we have to, I, we would charge for the parking and the use of the spaces and all of that. And so uh, we were, we felt that was a fair ask. Uh, there are three different things that kind of go with this I want to share in the conversation. One is, of course, we have school buses that come. I'm a firm believer that if the school buses are there and we're giving children an opportunity for an education, we should allow for that and that should not be charged. It's kind of part of our MO as a city and as a county of what we're trying to do. So that's one of the asks is to make sure that y'all are okay with us not charging charging for the use of the spaces when they're doing the educational piece and the school buses can park in the on-street parking at no cost, which we are 100% in agreement with. The second part that they had asked for was to allow for uh, their, uh, when they have shows, for there to be staging for the sale of merchandise. And we said they could utilize it, but they would need to pay for it because that's a for-profit, it's gaining money, and we didn't feel that that was appropriate, that we're giving them free parking while they got a merchandise sitting in a, and it's, it's actually going to be like a um, trailer kind of concept that folds out and it's kind of open and sells merchandise and stuff for the 
for the show. So we felt like we were okay with providing that, but felt like they should pay for that. So that was a no that we said to that. Then the third ask is the use of the on-street parking for their loading and their unloading. And again, given that they've already gone through and priced out their season, they're just asking if we would waive and consider waiving the parking for this season. And then next season, they will build all that cost into their new season prices. So I'm here before you to see if you would be comfortable with us moving forward with those requests. Um, and it is our staff's recommendation that we do. Thank you. Any questions, comments, commissioners, please? Uh, are we going to I hope continue the the uh, practice of school buses being able to park free? Yes, ma'am, and that's okay. why that's actually in here and kind right. of spelled out that way. So, okay. Yes, ma'am. Right. So it, it is our recommendation. We do feel that's really important. Yes. Okay. But so, if that ever changes, you'll come back and say, oh, yes, so. ma'am. But we, it okay. is it is our intention to do that always and make that available for free. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I don't want to make. Uh, yeah, I mean, you make anything more complicated. Please just state your name for the record. Yes, please. It's Joe Hall, 618 Church Street, Suite 210 37219. I represent TPAC. Um, it's not only that the, the seasons were packaged and sold. Um, these are not all TPAC performances. This is the rep. This is the this is the opera and other production companies that, with all the pricing already set, it's really tough for TPAC to then go pull those fees out of them or extend those. And so it, this is recognizing the that downtowns are different places with many many new challenges. We are very supportive of what you're trying to get done. But insofar as this came after the season was sold, if our request is to defer it to the next packaging season when prices can go can be extended to patrons so thank you for your consideration that yes council member thank you chair um director alarcon can you just speak to um to mr hall's point you know it's the rep it's the opera it's tpac a lot of our cultural institutions are um situated downtown so as we roll out this new pricing i would imagine as as uh TPAC was uh, informed and started figuring out how are they going to factor that in. Can you just speak more broadly to um, how, as a commission and a department, um, we're engaging in these conversations? Because I always want to come from a place of fairness, right? Mm -hmm. So I um, absolutely respect um, the, the position here. But if another cultural institution that, you know, needs the right of way. Like, can you just sort of speak to more broadly how this fits in with um, how we're communicating about that and how, you know, we're engaging that fairly with everyone? Yes, ma'am. So, um as you are well aware, we're moving to 24-7, so we've started conversations with a lot of the folks that have been utilizing our parking for other means. So, um, and as we are discussing with them, when we find that they're already in these financial positions, such as TPAC is, and in fairness, understanding that this is a change that's coming about relatively quick, it really wasn't shared, we would then still have to bring that before this board because we need your authority to consider waiving the fees. So every time we sit and we discuss with them and we feel like the, rec the request is very fair, we're actually writing that up and bringing it to them. And even if we don't feel like it's fair, we're still writing it up and bringing it before y'all because y'all are the body that gets to make the decision. We would just might make a recommendation of not to support. But in this case, given the circumstances, the fact that the season's already been set, we and this is a new practice, we felt like this was a very fair request. The only thing is the buses, we want to continue that practice even afterwards because we do feel very strongly that we need to be supporting that institutional availability. Okay, I appreciate that. So if, say, um, Country Music Hall of Fame or any of our other museums or entities were to come to you with a similar request, it would be um, uh, conducted in the same way that this request was. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. And, and if you remember correctly, we have had the Country Music Hall of Fame before y'all, but that was relevant to a valet operation. And because we were changing it, we were also asking for, give us some time, give them some time. They've kind of already set their season. Next season, they're willing to build it into their cost. So again, that was one one of the reasons we bought it. Something similar, but that was valet related as where this is related to self-parking meters spaces. Go ahead. I move for approval. We have a first. Is there a second? We have a first and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? It has been approved. Thank you. Next item is 5.02. 
which is a request for approval of transitional fee schedule for food truck parking and permitting associated with street eat events from 2023 to 2026. This has been requested by Mr. Lopak, BJ Lopak. Is Mr. Lopak here? Okay. All right. Director Alicorn. Thank you very much. Again, Mr. Chair, um, a similar situation here. We actually have been working with the food, this, on this food buck, food truck operations over many years. And typically they have been taking up one particular street that is metered parking and not paying any of the fees. It's roughly around $400 every time they do the event and the fees that it would cost um, per month. And so um, since this is not built into their environment, they kind of have, um, there's one gentleman that's actually listed here who makes the arrangements to have the food trucks available. And again, we think this is a great amenity for downtown. It kind of creates a really good Good public space as well. We had said, well, what if we do it this way? We'll work at it this year. We won't do any charge. Next year, we'll up at 25% and 50%. That way, it gives the food truck some opportunity. It won't deter it. He's afraid if we just come in and we pay it, and he has to pass that on, none of the food trucks will come down. They they do not make as much money as we all think, but they do make some money, um, And but they provide this um, you know public space that we're trying to create downtown, that atmosphere. So we were in agreement that the first year, we we would do um, over this season would be no we would not charge and so we're asking for your consideration of waiving that fee and then next year we would do 25 percent so it would be a hundred every single week that they actually are down there and then the following year it'd be 50 percent and then after that we'd go to the full percent that way they can slowly build into their business plan to be successful and we'd be able to encourage other food trucks to come into the downtown area to provide this service level thank you with that i'll take any questions any Questions? Yes, Council Member. Um, Director Alarcon, so um, Mr. Loftback with Best Food Trucks Tennessee, is it, does he represent kind of as a, um, a, a business association or a consortium of some sort for the, uh, the, the food truck vendors? So was it he was the organizer that would kind of, you know, we're going to be here on this date between this time and and uh, and so forth. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. He is the organizer. So he actually organizes, it brings the food trucks, bring them downtown, sets it all up. Um, so he's been the one that's been doing this for multiple years. So when he, and he goes through the special event process. Okay. So when he came through the special event process this year and it was brought to my attention, um, I said, unfortunately, the rules have changed <laughs> and I do not have the authority. I need to take this to commission. So this is why I'm before you today. Okay, and may I pose a follow-up question, Chair? Okay, um, I guess I, I appreciate um, my husband uh, used to work downtown, but largely works from home now, right? And so this was something that folks in his office used to often um, participate in. So I do appreciate that we've kind of got a societal dynamic now and, um, and that, you know, food trucks do absolutely bring a vibrancy to downtown and we want to support that. Can you speak to, um, like the, the preceding request, um, for TPAC, the opera, the rep, obviously they do kind of annual ticketing packages. And so next year they factor it in. Um, I do appreciate when we bring new policy colleagues that we're affording kind of waivers and transition time. Can you speak to though, a really long horizon? Horizon on something that is, all due respect, only four hundred bucks a month. So putting like a a three year horizon on that and kind of saying seventy five, fifty percent, twenty five percent, it seems maybe unnecessarily complicated. Um, and so uh, I just I, I just want to kind of understand: was that at the request of the businesses? How did you arrive at sort of this uh, complex? Uh, Package. Thank you very much, um, um, Commissioner Councilmember Henderson. Um, I need to correct myself. It's four hundred a week, not a month. So my apologies. I appreciate that. That's yes. helpful. Okay. Cody okay. just whispered that in my ear. Um, so it was a conversation that we had between um, the, the the gentleman that handles special events for the city, as well as the food truck vendor. And so it was a discussion on their business practice model and what they felt, he felt that he could continue to support the, the, 
the special event and as well as what it could look like. So he felt like this year, because they're kind of already set, he's already got the people lined up. There was no mention of everybody having to put more money in the bank. Um, and it's already pretty much a tight, you know, on bottom line. He felt like some people would just drop out and therefore it become really... It, it would die. I appreciate that, Director. In fact, we can just kind of curtail the explanation because now you've said it's 1,200 yeah. a month rather than so 400 a week. So I, I, I kind of revised my question. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank All you for right. allowing me to make the correction. Okay. Any further questions? Is there a motion to approve? We have a first. Is there a second? We have a first and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, it's been approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next item is uh, 7.01, Smart Parking Program Implementation and Enforcement Approach. And it says, Ms. Director Alicorn, you're back up again. I'm just going to sit here for the rest of the meeting. Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to revisit with y'all about our approach as we move forward. So as you, you the next item up, you're actually going to get a demonstration of the meters itself, the application on the technology. So we wanted just to sort of um, highlight again the enforcement again, trying to under, uh, to be, I don't want to say soft, but realistic. This is a new practice. We're moving to 24-7 in the downtown area. And then out on the West End from 6 a.m. to midnight, we really want to kind of have a, uh, an opportunity to let people adjust. Uh, there's been a practice here of no of no paying for parking after five o'clock, and we do understand that this is going to be a bit tough for a lot some areas of the community. So I just wanted to kind of lay out the game plan for y'all of what we're doing. Make sure there are no concerns, but also if you get any questions raised, please feel free to direct them to me. I'm more than happy to have conversations with anybody that would have some. But the way we're really looking at doing enforcement is we are looking that after today and we do the introduction of the new meter and the, and the technology, we are looking that once the meters are in, we're going to start rolling them out. Our game plan is in rolling them out, though, is that we're going to pretty much keep the hours that we have in play as is. And as we get to where more meters are out on the street and the signage is up and we pull it back, we'll slowly roll out those streets to where they're going to 24-7. We will be doing soft enforcement on those particular streets as we roll out. And what I mean by that is we're going to be doing warnings. So for about two to three weeks, we're actually going to give folks a warning ticket saying, hey, we have a new rule. And this is 24-7. You need to pay the meter. Next time, if you actually park here without paying the meter, you have the potential of actually getting cited and getting a true citation. So we really want to give people an opportunity to do compliance versus enforcement. That's really our goal is to get compliance. And we feel there has to be an education component. So we've actually have ordered warning tickets that we will be passing out that collects the information on the vehicle and that will be put on their dash and it has also a nice little education piece on it about our new policies, our new hours of enforcement and how it's all working and also about paying the meters. So I just wanted to let y'all know what the game plan is because we're not going to come out with um, guns a-blazing. Uh, we actually um, and I probably shouldn't use that, but we're not going to come out hard-nosing. Um, we're going to just, we really do want to try to make this an educational component. We want to kind of transition our community. I think that's a good way to put it. Transition our community into understanding what our new hours of enforcement and as well as the new meter technology that we now have available. Okay. Make sure I caught everything. Okay. Any questions from commissioners? Yes. Commissioner Woods. Someone asked me if when this uh, is operational, can they park all day if they keep feeding money in on their credit card? So it depends. And let me answer that. If this space has a time limit, so let's say the sign says you can park here $2.25, but it has two hour limit. The answer to that is no. The most they can park there is two hours. 
If there is no time limit, then yes, ma'am, they can, and the system will allow them to do it. So if they are using the technology, such as the scan of the QR code or pay by text or the app, if there's available time available to purchase, they'll actually receive a notice saying, hey, would you like another hour? You have another hour available, and they'll have the option to be able to pay it. And what else is really good that I learned that I didn't know, and this is this is actually different, um, and this is something that our partners, LAS, are bringing to the table. Um, it, very much like, you know, when you go and fill up your car with gas and it gives you, it does, it kind of does a, a pre-sell, but you don't actually get the charge until you finish the gas is pumped, but you're, you're, it just holds that money. They're going to do the same thing. Um, they're actually going to hold it. So let's say you're, you have a four hour parking, you're allowed four hours. You decide you're only going to be two hours. So you pay for two hours, but you end up needing to add that extra two hours. So now it is four hours. They did a hole on that first placement and not on the second. What what that does is there is a convenience fee that is added for the cost of that. If they had to do it in add hours, other vendors actually charge it twice. So they did it the first and then when they add. We're not doing that. We're doing it just like a, you were getting a gas pump. You're going to have a hold put on. You can add to it. And at the end of it, you're transitioning and you're paying once. And so therefore, you're only getting the convenience fee once, which I think is really fantastic because my experience has been the other where every time you utilize it, you're paying that convenience fee. So I'm really excited about that option. I feel like we're giving a better service level to our community. So if, some, oh, so if someone asks me who's small business uh, about someone taking up a space around their business all day while they're actually doing something else, uh, uh, whatever is set up with that, like street, that's something, are y'all going to talk to uh, the people who own businesses or say what's going to work best for you or how are, how are people going to know if it's something that's a two hour limit, four hour limit, how's that gonna be determined? So a lot of that is actually already determined. So right now we are not making any changes. A lot of the areas within our city are actually already set at a two hour limit or at a four hour limit. I think we have very few, very few three hour limits. I don't even think we have any no, three hour limits. It's, it's either, two, it's, most of it's a two hour and the very few have four hour. So we're not looking to make any changes, but as we move forward, so right now our goal is to get the meters up, get the signage up, get people educated, transition us over to the new technology. And then as we're pulling, cause we'll be starting to collect data at that point. So we'll have a better idea of understanding where the tickets got written, what the, t I mean, was it for overtime? So right now, if we write a ticket, it's all written manually. We're not collecting any data. Now we're going to be able to collect data on where the tickets are written, why it was written. So if it's for overtime, we know someone extended past the two hours. We'll be able to look and see how many of those tickets are written. We'll be able to look at the hour of duration that also comes from the meters. So there's a lot of great data we're going to be able that we may come to the to the terminology that, hey, we probably need to make this a four hour limit, not a two hour limit, or vice versa. And yes, I mean, at that point, we would definitely do a visit to the businesses. But they also will be able to contact us, and we definitely can do the analysis. Just need to give us a little bit of time to get the data, because right now we really do not have great data, or any data for that matter. Yes, council member. Thank you, Chair. And, and mine is a little bit of a follow-up question to Commissioner Woods is I know a lot of, you know, what I talk to folks about in better managing our curb is to be small business supportive, right? Mm -hmm. So that people don't park they are all day long. Um, I also feel like, uh, you know, some of the work that we're trying to do here, whether it's moving to 24 seven or uh, is simplifying, right? You know, so it's not like it's this time here and it's that time there and it's four hours here and it's two hours there. And like who can, you know, it's 225 here and 175 there. Like I'm, I'm wanting us to kind of converge on some um, uh, simplicity and clarity, but also offer kind of the options. So. At this juncture, the difference between, say, two and four, like if I just kind of thought about it off the top of my head, I would say, why not make it all two, but with the, basically that you can augment it, right? So if you are, you go to one business, 
Then you go to another one. Maybe I'm going to go over here for lunch. Oh gosh, you know, you don't want people to be stressed out, right? You want them to be enjoying their time downtown. This meal is going a little longer than I thought. I'm going to add on, on the app mm -hmm. and so forth. So um, can you kind of um, preview or are you just going to wait till you get the data? I mean, I would see sort of like, oh, it's, you know, it's too across the board, but you can add another hour or two rather than having four and two, but then you add the hours, but then you, do you know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I, I do understand exactly what you're asking. And I will tell you, um, I've been here a little over a year and I really um, have had conversations with different businesses about time limits and a bulk of our t current time limit is two hours. So uh, it does. It is four hours in certain areas when you get over on the west end. But I really haven't been addressed by many businesses about altering the time limit. And so I think within 30 to 60 days, we'll start having the data to really understand what the business, what business practices are happening on the street by people that are coming and visiting and staying in that area, where we just are really kind of guessing right now are based on someone telling me what's going on. Um, so I would say we can get there, and I agree with you. Some Simplicity is the best, but then also there is that business need, um, but I'm not really haven't been asked much. I've spoken to a few businesses over the course of the last year about the time limits, our meters in general, our, most of it's unloading they want. Um, that's really, we do have those conversations. And one of the things we haven't done a great job in the past, but I think y'all are seeing we're doing much better now is we're bringing a lot of that to y'all. And we're also drafting up policies for them. So I do feel like one of the things that's in our business plan is coming back with the policy of how that would work and bringing that to you, I just would love to have some data behind it to have that conversation for y'all. Yes. On the, on the data, um, who has access to that data and how are we keeping it? Is that something like, are we, do we have certain metrics that you all are tracking that you'll provide reports to us or to the public? Like, what does that look like? Yes, sir, we do. As a matter of fact, there are metrics that have been established in the business plan and in the operation plan for LAS that has all of that that we can bring together. We do kind of plan on putting together, not kind of plan, that's not appropriate. We are planning to put together a dashboard that we would be able to bring this forward to you that would show length of hours, average pay, all of that kind of information how much downtime we have. So in essence, if a meter's down for any significant amount of time, there's actually a performance measure for labs that they have to meet. And if they don't, that's a dashboard we're going to have. So we're going to be able to bring you all of this great data. And as far as digging in a little bit further about time limits and business and unloading zones and all of that, that will be forthcoming and we'll have that. But that is digging in a little bit deeper to the data, um, but there'll be a standard dashboard and then we'll be able to dig in deeper to the data to give you different reports if you would like it. But we took some of the basic ones that are mainly, I wanna say that drive the business and we felt like those were the important ones to drive on the dashboard first. Yes. Yeah. I can share um, with the commissioner between all the different kind of mayoral administrations, there was a time we had a very kind of public face, a, a data platform. So multiple departments could put in a variety of data sets that they thought were of public interest. Um, that does still exist. Um, but I would say, you know, there's a little bit of the kind of, you know, fine tuning what's in the spreadsheet. How do we do that? But I think that is um, a, a platform um, that's good just from an accountability perspective perspective. So um, I, I think that lives out there. So whatever administration is is next, that, that could potentially be, because I think especially in this space, mm -hmm. what you hear often around, you know, tickets and parking and, you know, it, it, it trends a little bit to, to the negative, right? That like, you know, oh, this is where we're issuing tickets for revenue generation, that kind of stuff. So I think having that data in a publicly available place is a good way to have a database conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Most definitely. Yes, we'll go, Commissioner Let's Adams. Go. We'll go. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, there. Okay. You go, you go next. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> uh, I did not question. think this would get that much conversation, but I love yeah. it. Uh, my question was just, um, how many citations will it take for somebody to get a barnacle? 
So uh, they are required to have three. This is actually drafted in state legislation and also in our ordinance. They have to have three fully executed citations. So what I mean is someone gets a citation, it goes over to court, it's fully executed, and it's not paid through the court system. So when the courts actually have three of those, they create a scoff law. It'll be a report that they'll actually provide to us, and those are the folks that would actually get it. Then we would update it in our system, and that's where someone can get beamed and actually receive the barnacle yeah commissioner woods last question so i've already been getting reaction from people if they're asking me or not happy or want more clarification when as this is rolled out should i direct them to ndot to their local council representative what's the best way for them to feel like they're being heard so the best way right now actually is for them to put something into hub nashville because I have to respond to Hub Nashville, and that's another data point measure that I would provide to you is how many complaints we received in through Hub Nashville, how many of them we got resolved, and also what the complaints are, and then here's how we actually got them um, handled and executed. So the best way right now is Hub Nashville. Is it got a great tracking mechanism for us. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Any further comments? So we'll look forward. This commission will take... So we roll out and getting additional information. So yep. thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate very it, much. Mr. Chair. And I think the next thing is we'll get ready to have a demonstration of the equipment. And before we do that, let me, because I'll oversight, Council Member Withers is here. Welcome, Council Member. Just wanted to acknowledge you. And we have representatives from LAS that are here and the LAS team. How are you? Thank you very much. Um, so thank you all for coming. So we're going to have a little show and tell, just like school. We are. I'm going to first let the team go through and introduce themselves to you, and then we'll take it off. So I'm going to start from my left, and we'll go to the right. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Rob Maroney, Vice President of Government Services. Hit I'm the set. button on the right. Right. There you go. Sorry about that. Rob Maroney, Vice President of Government Services with Last Parking. Hi, everyone. I'm Patrick Ryan. I'm VP of Innovation for Last Parking. Thank you for having us today. Natalie Snow, Vice President of Sales for Flowbird. So here from um, as a technical resource. Let the show begin. Let the show begin. All right. Okay. You, guys, you guys were doing such a great job of uh, discussing. I think you covered about half of our presentation today. So um, we'll be we'll be brief. Um, we did want to come uh, to the commission today to give you a demonstration of, you know, what is um, seen as the customer facing technology. So it's really the pay stations and the e-commerce solution that we're providing. Um, before we dive into that, just kind of to give you an overview of what the whole system looks like, because it is a fully integrated parking ecosystem, right? And it's made up of several major components. They include the pay stations, which Natalie will be talking about in a little bit, um, the e-commerce platform, that Patrick will walk you through that allows for a multiple of digital transactions, allowing customers to pay using their phones. It's also an integrated citation management system, which includes license plate recognition and the barnacle system that you spoke of a few minutes ago. All of that is based on license plates, right? So the, so the license plate serves as a credential. It's used for payment, but it's also used for enforcement. And then all of this data feeds into our business intelligence platform. And that's where you're going to get the data analytics that you're looking for and where we'll be able to push out reports to you. Again, today, we're really focused on the customer facing technology. So that's the pay stations and the e-commerce platform. So I'm going to turn it over to Natalie to walk, walk you through sort of um, the uh, attributes of the pay stations, which we also brought one today to show you. Um, so maybe after the meeting, if you want to get more of a hands-on demonstration, we can do that as well. Perfect. Um, so the base station that we're going to be installing on street um, is a nine and has a 9.7 inch screen. So what we've tried to do and as technology has advanced is take what everyone's so used to, you know, utilizing on their smartphone putting it on a kiosk, 
Um, but the idea of you can put more information out there for the public, the kiosk can become something other than just a payment method or just, you know, a box that accepts money for parking on street. It can show you are here signs. We can show videos for different merchants. We can run advertisement for farmers markets, those types of things. Um, so we... It gives us a lot of, it gives you a lot of flexibility and the end users, you know, the ability to interact with, I mean, it's a box on the street, it takes money for parking. So um, how can you make that, you know, as, I guess, sexy to use as possible. Um, I think that's a fair word. Um, that is a fair word. Um, <laughs> on street. So with the big touch screen, it, all the meters will be solar and will communicate in real time via cellular communication. I was speaking to a gentleman earlier. I'm not sure where there you are. Um, we have the ability to go around in the city because in every city you could Verizon might work in one location. T-Mobile might be better at another location, AT&T. So we, as we're going through the implementation process, we'll figure out, okay, Verizon works best in this location, AT&T works best in this location, we can um, change out the SIM cards to work reliable. Um, what we don't want is, especially since you're moving to pay by plate, are erroneous citations that are being written. Um, that will just kind of really be kicking into the stomach of, you know, starting a new program if, you know, bad citations are being written. Um, we have the ability to with these meters, it's going to be credit card and coin. Um, we can always, you know, take the coin away if we're finding that, you know, more and more people are just using credit card only, especially based off of um, different rates that are being put out there. We'll also be able to bring into the back office, um, much like Laswell with the data platform, because of our integration so strong, being able to pull all of the mobile payments as well as the text payments and the QR code payments into one platform so that from um, an on-street occupancy standpoint, we'll be able to see kind of all paid, um, all paid plates on street to be able to help guide people to different areas. So instead of, you know, circle around, waiting, trying to find a place to park, we can actually show people on a website and publish that information. You know, an off street location is going to get you there a lot quicker. Quick, quick, just clarification. So this is where you could try to figure out exactly where parking places are when you go downtown. Is exactly. that correct? That's correct. supposed to be the advantage of this type of system. Exactly. And it would come up on this device. Correct. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, the cabinets are stainless steels. We've got 15,000 of the touchscreen meters that we started deploying in 2018 deployed across the country. So from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon, we've got, you know, close to 100 of them in Key West. So from a durability standpoint, um, they are going to <coughs> last a really long time. We started rolling out the stainless steel cabinets um, in 2004 in Baltimore. And I don't know if you've been to Baltimore lately, but everyone loves to get to tag something in Baltimore. And so from a graffiti and sticker standpoint, being able to have the powder coat, um, easily able to remove stickers, clean off graffiti, um, You'll be happy with the stainless steel component. All of the components within the meter are modular. So as technology does change, you don't have to get a whole new meter. You can do different upgrades. So we are currently in the process, speaking of Baltimore, um, upgrading their meters to this touchscreen technology from the same cabinets they've had since 2004. Um, it's ADA compliant. Any questions? I know that was a lot. So for some reason, I'm fixed on data today. But okay. <laughs> for example, if somebody puts their credit card in there, is that credit card information being stored? I personally have, you know, have had my information taken and it came from a public parking kiosk. So it's, where's that data going and how, you know, if it's outside of Google Pay or Apple Pay, how is that protected? And if somebody comes back up, is that something reoccurring where they've saved that information or profiles? Or can you explain 
expound on that a little bit more. No, absolutely. So we have to follow the um, PCI, PADSS guidelines for credit card encryption and protection. The way that the credit card reader sits, it is almost impossible to get like a skimmer on it. Um, all of the credit card data is encrypted and is encrypted in the back office. Um, from the time that the credit card swiped, it follows the PADSS PCI compliance, sends it straight over, and then we're not storing we're sorting the encrypted version with just like, I think it's the last six digits that are um, available in case we need to issue a refund or someone wants a receipt after the fact. Are coins still used a lot? More and more organizations are going away from coins just because it costs so much money to handle money. Um, because it's a new system, and Diana and I talked about this at length, you have to make sure that we're taking care of the unbanked. Um, and so ideally, because we have no data to see where payments are coming from, where will the mass, you know, vast majority of payments, you know, happen. Um, I was mentioning earlier, we're going to accept card and coin and all of the meters at the beginning of the rollout. We are able to, at whatever point, once Diana has all of the data and can kind of figure things out, you have the point, you have the option to remove the coins and put a blank out plate, and then it would just convert those meters into credit card only. So it's just a matter of getting the information, knowing what the rates are, knowing what the community will support from an unbanked perspective, and then being able to have that data so that we can make good decisions moving forward. And then last question, if it's out of service, what's the backup plan to being collected? So when the meter is out of service, what we'll actually do, um, before you had like this large touch screen technology, it would just say meters out of service, go to another meter. So on this, we can actually display the um, text information so that you're still able to pay for a parking transaction, as well as have the QR code on the display. So instead of the meter saying, it's out of order, it's still going to give you a message of payment is required and you don't have to look for another meter in order to make those payments. So you could use the QR code functionality or you could obviously go to another meter if you had quarters um, or it would display um, the text message information so that you could make payment. And I also just want to let the commission know that there is a performance measure for downtime of meters that we actually have as part of the business and operational plans with LAS. It's a quick, my experience in some of the private parking lots where they have these kind of devices is many of them seem to be notoriously slow. Mm -hmm. And so the, the lines tend to queue up. So is there sense of speed, et cetera? No, absolutely. Um, you can't have slow meters in the city of Philadelphia or you know, people just get killed waiting to park. Um, no offense. But um, so the meter goes really quickly. We should be able to get through. And again, it depends on you know, how complicated you want to make it, how many check boxes, da, 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 da. But you should be able to get through the entire payment process in less than 30 seconds at the meter. And that's putting in your license plate, that's swiping your credit card, um, you know, deciding whether or not you want a receipt, putting in your phone number to get a text message receipt for extend options. But the entire workflow process should be less than 30 seconds. And a lot of those ones in the lot, I mean, those are a lot of old loop twos and old technology that just is slow. Yes, ma'am. Shout out to Philadelphia, the city I love. Sorry, they didn't win the Super Bowl. Um, uh, it's a great city. Um, to the chair's question, I wonder, so if you are on the app mm -hmm. and you're there in your car and you've pulled up and you kind of know from the app where you are, you know, queuing concerns or otherwise, you could just complete that transaction in your car without walking to the kiosk at all, correct? Absolutely. Okay. So you'll be able to, and with the sign package and how the sign information is going to be displayed. So if you see 
people at the meter queuing to pay. You also have the QR um, code that you can scan from a contact list, you know, scan that QR code that could make a payment. Um, you could text could make a payment, the app could make a payment, and then you could also make the payment at the kiosk. So it's throughout this entire process, um, being able to give people as many payment options as humanly possible is the key here. It's Yes, every city wants to, you know, increase revenue, but it's not through citation writing. I think someone brought that up earlier. You never want to put it out in the public that, hey, we made $2 million writing citations. Said no. So being able to have all of those different payment methods, because compliance is what you want in order to generate revenue. So... So you can complete it in the car, Correct. then I guess, you know, in our really high foot traffic areas, uh, a lot of business, a lot of restaurants, you know, um, if you were just from a design perspective, right, like I know that there's a QR on the uh, kiosk itself, but have y'all kind of thought to like make sure the QRs on the side or on the back or whatever, so people don't feel like somebody's line jumping by trying to kind of get up to the front and register the QR? No, absolutely. Um, yeah, if you go back a couple of slides, you'll actually see the sign image. Yeah. And we so also have, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Natalie. We're going to have QR codes on all the signs. Mm -hmm. So anybody can easily walk by and, and scan it. There's also going to be QR codes on the meters. We're even talking about doing big, you know, QR codes printed on the sidewalks as we roll out the program. So it's going to be, it's going to be very easy for people to pay. Yeah. Yes. How many of these machines do you plan on installing? Well, right now we have uh, we have purchased 150, 125, excuse me. Yeah, I can word. never remember them. 125 meters at this moment. Uh, the biggest difference is you have single space meters, which is one per space. This one, some of these kiosks, the multi-space meters can cover anywhere from 10 to 14 spaces or even a whole block it can cover. So we have right now, we're starting with 125. I will also share with the commission, we are gonna be testing some areas where we're just gonna put signage up that's gonna offer the e-commerce. And we're gonna see how successful that is. If we are finding that a lot of people do want meters or an, and another uh, payment option such as coins, then we would come back and add the meter. But we are gonna test a few areas with just the e-commerce that would be available. So they'll be paying for using the QR code, the app, are the um, uh, pay by tax and not have a meter actually there for payments. We're going to test that as well. How expensive are they? They cost $6,500 for the meter. And so, and I would say the life cycle of a meter is technically around seven years, uh, give or take. Uh, but the technology is changing. And I think what I was impressed about on the Flowbird is the opportunity that we can, mod is kind of modularized. So as some of the technology upgrades, we would be able to pull that out and put something else in. Um, but the typical life cycle of, of a meter, um, of a multi-space meter is roughly around seven years. How long do you think it'll take to recruit the cost of installing these? Uh, I think I feel sir will recruit it in the first year. Ma'am. In the first year. I think we'll have a return the on first our investment. Year. Yes, sir. I think we'll have a return on our investment in the first year. That's good. If you, if it does that. I will yeah. I will provide that report with a big smile on my face. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. What? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll just so I want to preface a couple of things before we get started. Um, everything's configurable. So what we see on the screen, we had to put together the demo and get everything to you. So do not, please don't get all hung up, hung up on one little thing. So everything is configurable. Um, and so this is kind of our first stab. So when you go to the meter and you hit the bit, green start button, this is, um, could potentially be a screen that comes up. And what we did is, you know, you're parked in this district or are you parked in another district? So if we've got a district like in the CBD um, is one price, if you're parked in another district, because everything communicates in real time, you know, maybe I did park two or three blocks over, totally forgot to pay because I'm on my phone. I go to the meter, I can still pay 
for my vehicle in the appropriate district and not get a citation. So all the meters are daisy chained for lack of a better term, but so you could pay for your parking at any meter um, throughout the city. So this on this screen and obviously with, because we are gonna be rolling out pay by plate, we'll have signage that says, you know, you're gonna need your license plate kind of everywhere. Um, I have some organizations that have actually made little bitty, you know, like the um, keychain that you have for like CVS or your grocery store, but it looks like a Nashville license plate and you can hand them out at like the, the I was gonna say the mall, but no one goes to the mall, like the library. Um, I don't think that people go to the library either, but you could hand them out at the city meetings and then people would be able to write their license plate. It's a cute little keychain. It says Nashville, whatever. Um, and so then people always have that with them. Um, so then the next screen would be, hey, go ahead and enter your license plate. The reason that we're asking for the license plate here now is because this is a new system. We have the ability to offer and it's just an option, um, residents like a different discount. So if you've gone through the whole process, I'm a resident, um, maybe I get 30 minutes free parking and 24 hour time, or maybe I get two hours free parking. So what you could do is if you did decide to roll out a plan like that, you would enter in your license plate. It would then kind of double check your license plate and go, oh, okay, you get, you're a resident. This is your, um, uh, you know, what the amount that you would pay versus a visitor. And so then it kind of helps increase revenue based off of a use tax versus people, you know, that have lived here forever are like, wait a minute, you're gonna start charging 24 seven parking, like this is unheard of. So you've got some options there. But so the next screen, you enter your license plate, it's gonna verify your plate status. Um, the next option is how long do you wanna stay? So because of the current ordinance, we've got an hour minimum and a two hour max. And so we're, instead of having you toggle up and down, we're just like, here's a two hour max button, boom, it's gonna give you your, your time. Um, obviously, if it were not a time limited area, then you would have, you know, do you want a max time or how many hours do you want to be here? And you could toggle up and down. Um, so again, this can be changed. How long, you know, do you want to stay? If you did hit the hour and the business rules do allow for you to extend, then you would get that, you know, text extension option. If you hit the two hour max button, it's not ever gonna send you that option to extend because you've already met, you know, your maximum. Um, other things that we can do just so that people aren't constantly cheating the system, and it is incredible the links people will go to cheat the system. If it's a two hour max, for example, what we're doing in Annapolis is you can't use the meter or any meter after your time has expired, right, for 30 minutes. So it's the idea of, okay, it's a two hour max in front of my building. The person at least has to move their car to a different spot or wait 30 minutes before they can interact with the meter. That's a configuration setting. So it's something to just kind of mull over so that you can. Quick, quick question. And I mean, this is way out of left field is can this be used to manage like loading zones and permit parking kind yeah. of locations? We will be doing all of that, sir. So okay. as we move through the program and we are collecting the data and understanding it, we will be using the technology that we are provided, whether it's through the Flowbird um, pay station or through our LPR system, our citation management system, we will be doing all of that. So we okay. do plan on moving into uh, a curb management um, process as well. Okay, so like for example, where there's a street with residential permit parking, it sounds like there's if you entered your license plate, it would say you're a resident, you're out, or it would tell you you're not and you need to move your right. car. And Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And we are actually working, and a lot of that will be done through our citation management system mm -hmm. that will be tied in with the Flowbird operation. Okay. 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 Thank and we are just as an FYI uh, commission, we are currently meeting with the different homeowner organization citation uh, civic associations through the different council members on the site, uh, residential parking permit programs mm -hmm. uh, to understand what they want that to look like. And that's been some really fun meetings I've been having. Okay. So, and because many of our corridors, 
it makes sense to park, but there's residential streets off to the side where there's been demand for Correct. Sometimes in the past, permit parking, but there hadn't been the enforcement to Correct. do it. And yes, we sir. could and that is something utilize this tool. Correct. And that is something we will improve at as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for. Yes, go ahead. Could you go back and explain the plate status section? Absolutely. So, okay, if in this example, I am a resident and I've registered that I'm a resident, I could, that would all be tied back to my license plate. So when I'm at the meter, um, and we'll just say residents get two hours free parking a day, okay? I'm at the meter, I type in my license plate, that verifying plate status is basically the meter checking with the back office and going, oh, you are a resident, so now I know what to charge you. That's what that has doing. nothing to do with like an expired tag or... Oh, no, it's okay. not that. No, it's, we're not monitoring expired tags. You have to register your vehicle tag, and then that actually then communicates with our citation management system, and that's how it determines whether you paid for the parking or not. And again, we're, we're looking for compliance over enforcement, and but if you didn't pay and you didn't enter your, cit your vehicle number, then we would know a citation needs to be entered, and we're doing that through the LPR system. We don't have any of these discounts she's talking about set up. At this we have residential time. parking permit program, and that's that is actually a program that has to go before council for approval. And we do have several of them throughout the city, and it's really identifying more of the residential streets, not the metered parking areas. Oh, sorry. So then this um, next option is going to say it's more of like a confirmation screen. So I hit the max uh, two hours. Hey, your parking is good from 557 to 757. Here's your total fee. The next screen, I'm swiping my credit card or putting um, my um, coins in. And then here it asks, um, do you want a receipt? You don't need a receipt. And it says that very clearly. Do you want a text message receipt or no receipt? So a lot of organizations, Portland, Oregon, for example, was, I think they were going through, they were pay and display, and then they switched to pay by plate. Um, they actually removed the receipt printers altogether and saved over two miles of receipt paper a day, which is pretty incredible. Um, so given the fact that you're pay by plate, you don't need a receipt. Um, I think we can always blank the receipts out. Like as we get the system going, people aren't getting receipts just because it would save you money on obviously maintenance and then, um, having to buy paper. I would think of it more from a sustainable practice than anything. Well, I parked in the music city center Saturday night and you couldn't exit until you pulled your receipt out of the machine, hmm. which I thought was odd. I didn't need a receipt, but it's, thank you. Some of the older technology, sir. Um, can I pose a quick question about the screen on which you enter the plate? Um, will you have sort of a, a prompt of any sort? I think I am thinking of the few times that I've done this, whether in another city or otherwise, and because you have numeric keys and letter keys, it's always been a little confusing to me. Like, do I need to put T in, like Tennessee? Like, I think there's a little bit of a mental moment where people are like, am I just entering the six numbers on the plate, or do I have to identify that this is from this state? And I would say that would be a helpful prompt if you were to so do something like that. Great question. Let me show you an example. Um. Oh, before I get to the, here, I'll just go this way. Just at the initial point of entry, right. I guess. So what I did is I added in what other cities are doing so that you could see their entire screen flow. So this is Chicago. Now, in certain areas in Chicago, so speaking of a loading zone or a not loading zone, so you can see kind of over on the left-hand side where it's got are you parked in a loading zone? Awesome. Then I'm going to charge you a loading zone fee. If you're parked um, car-wise, then I charge you that. But in this Chicago um, example, they actually want to collect the state. So we have a drop-down box of all the states. And we could certainly add that in if you feel like people would get confused. So we can add in, okay, what is your state? And then we can add in the key, and then the next screen would have the keypad or the keyboard so that you could put your plate in. We can also put more um, like verbiage at the top that just says you don't need state or what have you. So 
the nice thing about being able to change all the workflows is we can change it at any time and yeah. send the programming down remotely because the thing is, is we don't know what we don't know, right? We don't know what the constituents are going to want. We don't know what's going to be a hang up for people. So don't feel like as we go through this process that you're stuck with whatever programming, it can be changed at any time as we get more educated and roll the system out. Yeah, we appreciate that. And I think though, you know, for the city from a data perspective as well, I mean, I guess I'm so old. I remember when, you know, uh, Nashville used to be number two and Memphis was number one because it was bigger, but it was on population. You know, you could kind of tell what city you came from by the numbers on your license plate. Obviously we don't have that anymore, um, but to the extent that um, the license plate can just tell us, I think um, from a just, a management standpoint, you know, how many people are driving into the city to park on street or in a garage? Are they from Tennessee? Or are they from another county? Um, I don't know to what extent uh, license plate data, it's appropriate to have that or know that. Um, but yeah, I was thinking of it mostly from just a, a, a hang up thing, like it, would it be helpful? But then it occurs to me that from a data point, it might also be helpful. I have to admit, I, I stopped for a minute and thought about it as we were just discussing it now, um, and it could, but um, also you have to remember, um, we pretty much can run the license plate and know exactly where it's from, even though we may not know at that time what state is, because the license plate are in the way that they're actually put together are very significant to each in different states. Like some states have all letters and some states have some letters and some numbers. And then some states are the first two are letters and the rest are numbers. So there's a way to identify a lot of the license plate just by the way they're drafted on the, and, and they, and they're um, posted there. Um, so we could, um, think about that, but we don't hold license plate information unless we're writing tickets. So I'm taking that into mind. Um, and I will just share a lot of our vehicles are rented. So I don't know if that's going to give us quite the information because we're going to get, uh, we're going to find out that this particular car, even though it's a Florida tag, is actually a rental car that they got from um, National or something. So um, I'll play with that idea because I think there's some opportunities. I just need to figure out the, the true value. But thank you because you got me thinking. I'm not like that. The other slides are just some different, um, just to give you an idea of the different flexibility. So Chicago has a very kind of complicated, you know, workflow. Um, PBOT doesn't. And we can even, when the credit card, when you're near at the gas station, your credit card's processing, and sometimes it has like the really loud news anchor that's kind of screaming at you. So when our credit card is processing, we can also say, hey, next time use the mobile app or next time you can use a QR code. So we all we can push information out to the end user to help guide them how we want them to use the system the best. And then here's an example from Baltimore. I'm not going to bore you through all that, um, but any other questions on the meters? And I'll be more than happy to show you the meter um, a little bit later, I'll let you kick it, um, all that kind of fun stuff. So perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I think we've actually covered quite a lot of um, what I had to present here, which is great. Um, I'm just going to run through. Uh, if you were to look at the sign, uh, you have obviously the choice of paying at the pay station or paying directly on your phone. Before you jump, mm. just real quick, Commission, I just wanted to um, I show you um, next to our metro is kind of the logo we're considering that will be going out. Um, just want to share that with you. We've been playing with a lot of ideas, um, and this is where we've kind of landed. It's not written in stone, but just want to kind of share that with you all that this is what we're thinking of from a logo perspective. Chair, if I may, on the point of logo, Go ahead. can I ask, um, does Metro have a contract with a graphic designer? Um, because I feel like we've had some changes in Metro, whether that be the DOT or um, waste services being water. I, I just, are we designing these in house? I mean, I, I think a lot of the feedback, all due respect about the new NDOT, it's not particularly positive. Um, I 
don't love this logo. I just wondered, are we, are we doing this in-house? Are we working with a professional? How are we arriving at these new logos? So we are working with a professional through LAS. And so uh, we're, we're still beating this one up. I will share that with you. Um, there was um, another design to this, but then we uh, ran into some copyright issues. So this is where we're going, but it's not solid. Um, but it is where we are right now, but we're still playing with some, some ideas, but we can certainly continue to look at it. Okay, That's I why I mentioned it. I just yeah. wanted to throw it out there. No, I do appreciate that because I think in the spirit of whether it's Connect Downtown or otherwise, Councilman Withers and I will uh, perhaps remember when we used to have the Downtown Connector, um, it was so well branded, blue green. Everybody wanted to take the kind of the blue green bus. It it was very kind of well received. I see Portland, you know, has the green kiosk. Um, not saying we need to have a green kiosk, but I just think in this space, sort of, you know, thematically, if we think about how it all kind of works and together. we are doing that and just real yeah. quick um council member i want to share with you we will be working with downtown partnership as well as the conventions bureau and the convention center and the tourist bureau on rats so we do plan on wrapping a lot of our meters that will be kind of defining the area that they're in um, so that's why we went with the really central color versus something because we could have picked a different color and and we actually picked the, just the generic color because we have every intention of wrapping them to kind of help tell the story of Nashville um, and we'll be working with the different area business communities on what those wraps will look like and feel like and our partners and other agencies in the downtown core on those wraps as well. I appreciate that because I think by I folks need to recognize that's the parking kiosk. Right. Um, but also from a streetscape perspective with our business improvement districts, right, kind of the whole wayfinding sense right. of identity, thematic things they have going on. So that's good to know. Right. And the wrap will include a walking map as well. So you are here. And if you want to go to the first museum of Nashville or you want to get down to Broadway or you want to get over to the Music City Center or the Convention Center, there's going to be a you are here kind of map that will be available in every kiosk as part of the wraps as well. Well, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Thank you. No problem at all. And on, on that note, um, there are logos and colors on these screens, um, like Natalie's PlayStation screens. They're just placeholders pending any of those discussions. Um, so in addition to the meter, you have uh, a way to pay on your phone. You can either, you can either snap a QR or you can text. Um, we found pre-COVID, most people used the text function. Post-COVID, when menus and everything uh, busted out the QR codes, we've kind of swung the other way. But people will use one or the other, and everybody has a preference. Um, it doesn't make any difference which way um, which way it goes. So it's for it's for parking now for on street. It also works in ungated locations. Um, to, to get going, you just need to snap the QR or to uh, to text the lo the zone's number. Um, and and one really important thing, uh, certainly that's near and dear to my heart, is that these are these are guests, and many times they're visitors. And we don't force people to download an app, and we don't force people to sign up for an account. Um, they can just use it as a guest, no app, no account. Um, branding, as we just discussed, it's customizable per zone. Um, now, these are examples of the signs, um, but I'll, I'll show you the screens. Signs would, would be similar throughout. Um, once again, that's a decision of the commission and the department and the city. Um, but on screen, all of those things can also be customized. Um, and we've just rolled out Apple, and, Apple Pay and Google Pay as well. Um, we found that that makes for people paying on their phone a very fast way to uh, to pay and it shortens the number of screens so a lot of what we do in the phone world is assuming that people want to just do it quickly they don't want to think about parking at all so we try and make it as simple and as fast as possible any questions on on those so far um commissioner just real quick the next item on the agenda is actually a demo of the um um, app demonstration, which is actually going to be part of this. So those two are actually being combined. So I just wanted to point that out real quickly. Sorry, go ahead. Great. So in, in terms of those two different ways to pay, if you snap the QR, it looks like the example on your left. Um, if you text the text code, it looks like the example on your right. 
but they both bring you to that same point. Uh, there's a screen that can give uh, you know various instructions or restrictions or those kind of things right there, and you can okay that. Um, other than that, it really is one, which is your um, a screen of what the what the options are, and they might you might have a choice for one hour or two hour or whatever those are. Those can be varied. The customer can choose uh, what that is, and um, and then they hit next, and you can see that. Um, branded this zone specifically. Um, these are just placeholders, but this is the Gulch specifically. So people can, you can use that branding for different, for different areas. Um, so they would hit next and they get straight to the payment screen. All they have to do is enter their license plate right there. And if they want to use Apple Pay or Google Pay, that is the very, that's the very next button. Um, and as soon as they've done that, they get a confirmation that they've paid. And, and that kind of really is the entire presentation. Um, it's fairly straightforward, um, and it really is just about making it as simple as possible. You can see um, down the bottom that it isn't, that it, you can also pay with, with a credit card by entering your credit card, and those autofill if you have them loaded in your phone. But other than that, that's, that's the payment screen. Does anyone have any questions on those ones? Nope, I think we're good. Okay. Um, you, you don't have to register. You can register as well, and that saves things like your license plate and that kind of information for next time. Um, so that makes it one step faster the second time you use it. Um, but it depends locations. We have high um, repeat users in business communities, and they tend to sign up. Um, but in visitor areas, we get very low levels of sign up, and it, it really does vary um, across the board. Um, and as we mentioned before, one of our new features is the ability to extend time. So let's say you did have a four-hour zone or a two-hour zone, and um, perhaps you'd bought one hour of time, and your plan was to uh, only stay for one hour, but you're far from your vehicle, uh, you can um, extend your time by adding up to the, to the rest of that time, and it'll, it, will let, it will let you pay for that. Um, but yeah, you don't have to rescan the sign or anything like that. You can be right there. Um, it shows how long you want to extend for and tells you what the price will be. You hit next and you check out exactly the same way you did before. And, and um, as Director Alicon mentioned before, we actually only charge for the credit card one time. We hold it the first time around. Um, if you don't extend your time, when your time's over, we charge it then. But if you do extend your time, we only charge at the end of the transaction. So that way we, uh, we save all the credit card fees. So there's only one set of fees. Council Member Henderson. Um, for extending time, in, in your example, you know, typically somebody's going to have paid at, you know, 317 or whatever. So for the time extension, is that going to auto prompt from the time of expiration or from when you are engaging to extend? I would hope it would be the former. But... You're correct. And, okay. and it's a little... I... I'm having a bit of a senior issue. I can't really quite tell what those numbers are up there. It but just says like today, 2 p.m., like <laughs> it, round. It does. So it, what it does show is that your first payment was from 12 till 2. And then it, it clearly shows that the next payment is from 2 to, I think that's, I think that's three of it. <laughs> okay, um, but it could be like from 12, 13 to 1, 13, and that, then your next correct. one is 1, 13. That's correct. So if you chose to extend 10 minutes after you're there, you haven't, you haven't doubled up. We have we haven't double dipped. Yes, um, and uh, and you can just other than that, it works exactly the same way as the first time you used it. But you'll get a reminder. So you make your payment in 15 minutes before your parking session is going to expire, and those are typically configurable. Um, the patron would get a reminder going, "Hey, in 15 minutes it's going to expire. Would you like to extend?" then you would be prompted to go through the extension phase at that point. Um, if they said nothing or did nothing, then the credit card process would, you know, I would just like clear Correct. out yep. as the time cleared up. And if I may share, will we make clear then, you know, say, oh, you missed the prompt, you got a little busy or whatever, now it's two minutes after expiration, but you were still within an extendable uh, 
time frame, what's happening there? Like, do we need to be clear with people? Because I could imagine somebody might be like, oh my gosh, do I need to hurry back to my car now? Or I don't want to extend now because if I do, that shows that I overstayed. Like, are, are we going to be kind of clear on that from a communication so, standpoint? So we are considering a grace period. So for those type of instances, um, I hope that I'll have that organized and ready to bring back as a policy to y'all at the next meeting. Um, so we are discussing it, we're looking at it, and we're, we're formalizing what that looks like. We've had a discussion so far about a 10-minute grace period. So, for example, someone would pay for their parking, and let's just say they didn't get back, because nothing drives me crazier than when I'm parking in a garage and I go four minutes over and then I'm hit with this ridiculous bill. So we've been discussing a 10-minute grace period. Somebody's calling. Calling us. You're doing the right thing. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I'm at the Oscars and I just got <laughs> I just got played off. And the winner is um, <laughs> so we are discussing right now a 10 minute grace period, and I have to bring that back to for y'all as a policy. So we are we are working through that and what that will look and feel like, and we plan and hope to have that before you at the March meeting. I appreciate that, Chair, because I think especially stuff that's happening within the public right away and people are walking, like you just don't want people, oh, I'm going to dart across the street so I don't have to, you know, exactly. meet my parking threshold or I'm going to try to hurry up to drive right. out of this and garage, what that, what that will show is that they paid for an hour, but then a 10-minute grace period would be given. So it would show on their ticket or on their on their receipt, whatever is sent to them. It is, so I'm trying to figure out how we make that look so people understand they're getting the grace period. They're just not getting 10 minutes extra yeah. time. Or maybe it should be five. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm agnostic. I'm just. I know. Yeah. I know. And we haven't quite come to the final, but we are considering grace period, and we hope to have that before y'all next month. All right. Yes. Are there any additional questions? Yes. You said you had to have your license plate, right? Say that again, sir. I'm sorry. Your license plate. Yes, sir. Number. What if I put say release license plate number in it? <laughs> Put another, somebody else's license plate? Yes, ma'am. You will get a citation most likely, sir. I would what? You would get a citation then. So if you enter, a, if you do not enter the appropriate license plate number that's on your vehicle, you will actually receive a citation. Now you can come in and say, hey, I made a mistake. I was actually, I are, if you transfer, let's say you, you. How, how you going to know it? What my license plate number is. Well, we're coming through and we are scanning your license plate number through the citation management and license plate recognition system. So they're going to be driving through? Yes, sir. And they'll have Constantly it. driving yeah, through? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. We'll have it. They'll be driving through their car and that, that license plate recognition will actually pick up the tag. They'll be in real time that that tag number will be matched up with what's in Flowbird. And if it's our, and also what's in e-commerce. And at that time, if there is no registered payment for that license plate that the license plate register um, the license plate picked up they'll get a ding and say hey there's a problem with the license plate recognition that car didn't pay and they'll get out they'll go in the system they'll verify it and then they would write the appropriate ticket so in that case you would get a citation for not paying for the meter right. now there will be an appeal process that you will be able to go through um and that's going to be handled not unfortunately that's going to actually be handled by the courts so we write the citations and then it goes over to the court system and they will actually process it but there will be an appeal process that you would be able to go through um if you feel something was done incorrectly all right thank you yes sir any other questions? Yes, Council Member. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Brown was was maybe going there. Um, what um, transposing something, a, a, a fat finger situation? I mean, do you have a certain um, presumption around, I guess, data that things that do get missed? Like, can your system uh, figure that out? So. Um, I would like to come back and answer that question as we set up the citation management system, um, council member. Um, it's really hard. Then you start getting subjective. And I really am worried about giving any parking enforcement officer an opportunity to be subjective. Um, that's why there is an appeal process that you would be able to go in and say, hey, I was parked here. I did pay for it because you would have a receipt that showed that you paid. And those typically do get dismissed. So even if you did transpire it incorrectly, you're going to have a receipt, whether it's a hand or a text, you should have a receipt 
and they would be able to use that as proof of payment, and typically those tickets are dismissed. Before it ever even goes through the court process, there's actually an opportunity through the courts to do that. So there, if that does happen where something's transposed incorrectly or fat fingers, whatever, there's that opportunity does get lined up through the court system. But I really am very careful to not allow our parking enforcement folks to be in a subjective I appreciate position. That. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? This has been very interesting. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Okay. All right. The next item on the agenda is an update to the standing rules of the this commission. And uh, Teresa or Ms. Costonis, I think you have a presentation about ethics. Could, People will note there's an ethics section in the standing rules. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, this is a general um, ethics presentation that's not specific to traffic and parking. It is one that um, Metro Legal is giving to all the boards and commissions that we staff throughout Metro. We have given it before, so if a couple of you have been on the board for a couple of years, you may have seen this before, or at least a lot of it. We have updated it for 2023 and will continue to do so. We're probably every couple of years or so, we will be routinely giving these um, updated presentations um, to our boards and commissions just to make sure everybody has this information. Um, but um, <clears throat> so if you'll go to the second slide. Um, yeah, the goals of the training um, are listed here. You have to um, know when you can and cannot accept benefits relating to your role on the board, understand when you may be biased or have a conflict and should recuse yourself. Remember to disclose knowledge you have received um, about an agenda item from outside the meeting. Um, remember to articulate the specific reasons and basis for your decision or your vote. Understand that the Open Meetings Act prohibits deliberation outside of board meetings and the Public Records Act makes almost all of your emails open to the public. And also just to understand best practices for making informed decisions. Let me go on to the next slide. <clears throat> so, um, the code provision in the Metropolitan Code that addresses ethics is Title II, Chapter 222, 2.222, uh, lots of twos. Um, so this applies to a defined term called metropolitan employees. And employees, even though you all do not get paid, is specifically designed to include members of boards and commissions. So for the purposes of the ethics compliance, you all count as employees. And then it has um, uh, 222020 has a long laundry list of things that you cannot do if you are a Metro employee um, in order to kind of honor uh, um, ethics and conflict considerations. So the first one you see there is you cannot accept or solicit any benefit that might reasonably tend to influence you to act improperly in the discharge of your official duties. You can't use Metro property services or funds for personal purposes. You can't use non-public information that you get in your role as a commissioner for personal gain or for the gain of a family member or other employer. Did you go on to the next one? Um, you can't use a Metro position improperly to secure unwarranted privileges or exemptions for yourselves, your relatives, or others. You can't accept other employment which might impair your independent judgment in the performance of your Metro duty. And you can't accept any benefit which the employee should, which you should reasonably know was intended to influence any action taken in your official capacity as a commissioner. All right, can move on to limited exceptions. Great, thanks. You may accept these types of business. So these are the things you can accept. Um, if no conflict or appearance of conflict um, otherwise exists. And the word appearance is important because we're always not just trying to avoid actual conflicts, we're trying to avoid an appearance of impropriety. We don't want to make Metro Boards and Commissions appear as though they may be less than impartial to um, the public. Um, so <clears throat> if someone gives you an award of trifling value publicly presented to you in recognition of public service, that's fine. You can take the paperweight or whatever it is. Um, if you have um, 
receive gifts unrelated to your position as a Metro employee or a Metro commissioner. Um, you can keep all your Christmas gifts. They have nothing to do with um, your role as a commissioner. That's fine. Um, uh, the next one, um, it, so someone can buy you lunch if it's less than $25. And same thing, they can give you an item um, that a promotional item or hand produced item that is, is worth less than $25, but that's an annual limit. So that doesn't mean your, you know, your lobbyist buddy can buy you lunch, you know, once a week throughout the entire year, as long as it's under 25, it's just a one-time thing. Um, and I have a funny story about this. This ha rule has been changed and it used to only apply to the food and, and not to the additional items. And um, uh, so at one point, um, a colleague and I were watching a council meeting and um, uh, some organization was um, presenting a council member with a hat and he accepted it. And um, uh, my colleague leaned over to me and he said, that's okay as long as he eats the hat because the $25 was only for food and beverages at that point. <laughs> but we, we didn't make an issue of that and they did eventually expand that to include a few other items. So, and then this one comes up a lot for your discounted admissions, tickets, access to events or travel expenses. So if somebody's like, oh, I'm gonna send you to this continuing education or this conference in, you know, Malibu or wherever, you know, you probably can't accept that because it's probably more than $100 worth. Um, uh, but if it's less than 100, you can. Um, and then if, if you are invited to um, a fundraising benefit for a nonprofit by virtue of your role, even if that ticket would be more than $100, you can accept that. Um, moving on to Board of Ethical Conduct. Yes, okay, so there is an enforcement system for this and there is yet another board for that and that is the Metro Board of Ethical Conduct. And the same chapter, ch Title II, Chapter 222 um, has Section 040, which creates this board of ethical conduct. And they actually will hear complaints. They can also render advisory opinions. I, don't, I think that's interesting. I've never asked them to do that, but um, uh, that is something they can do. Um, and um, they can discuss the standards of conduct or an executive order which regulates ethical standards of conduct for employees of the, of the metropolitan government. So basically they're allowed to um, interpret this section of the code or this chapter of the code and um, uh, also um, mayoral executive orders relating to ethics and conflicts. Um, any elected official or member of a board or commission can request an advisory opinion from the board relating to compliance. Now, again, like I said, I think that's really interesting that that's available. I've never had one of my boards or commissions actually do that. But um, generally what people will do is they'll start with my office, um, my office staffs, the board of ethical conduct anyway, not me in personally, but another colleague of mine. And um, uh, so you can always ask us if you have a concern about whether your conduct um, is on the border or whether you need to recuse yourself or anything like that. Um, like we're glad to just directly discuss that with you and brainstorm with you and figure out what's your best course of action under those circumstances. Um, <clears throat> but also, you know, if you're unsatisfied with our response, apparently you can go to the board itself. Um, uh, the ethics complaint process, thank you. Um, uh, complaints regarding ethic, elected officials or, or members of boards or commissions are made to the Board of Ethical Conduct. So anyone out there watching MNN or whatever who just decides, you know, they don't like what you did can complain about you to the Board of Ethical Conduct. Um, and then, like I said, one of my colleagues with the Department of Law will investigate and evaluate and make a report to the board regarding the facts of the complaint in question. Um, and then the board, based on that, would decide whether it's worthy of holding a hearing. Um, and if a hearing is held, then parties have a chance to um, appear and present their case. Um, go on to penalties. Um, the Board of Ethical Conduct can then recommend to the council that the person be censured. They can recommend that the um, commissioner um, resign his or her position. They can refer the matter to a district attorney for prosecution if a criminal law is violated, or if it appears that one has been violated, we'd let the DA decide that. Um, and um, it also says refer matter to um, director of law requesting civil action to be initiated. I will say 
I've been with the Department of Law for 15 years, and at no point have I ever seen that happen. So that at least I would say is very uncommon. Um, had to be a pretty bad case. Um, uh, then go on to goal number two, thank you. Understand when you may be biased or have a conflict of interest and should recuse yourself. So you all each as commissioners have a duty of independence. So that means you can't act based on your own self-interest. You can't act based on a bias in favor of people you know personally. And you can't act <clears throat> based on the interests of the director or um, contractors with whom your board interacts. Um, so you must be impartial and act based on the law and evidence presented to you. So here's like the analysis you will make if you are wondering if you have a potential conflict. Should I recuse myself? And the answer is yes. If you are biased based on a personal interest, for example, where you would gain or lose money pretty directly from whatever decision the commission makes, then you should recuse yourself for sure. If you are biased or prejudiced for or against a party, either as an individual or as a member of a group, for example, if you have close friends or business partners and you just feel like, you know, this, this is my business partner, this is my firm that's appearing on this matter, you know, I, I, you know, I would have an appearance of impropriety if I um, participated in this decision, I'll recuse myself. Um, and then just generally, if for whatever reason you can't fairly or impartially weigh the evidence because you have prejudged factual issues. And again, if you're ever in doubt, if any of these apply to you, just contact me. I'm happy to like talk it through with you. Eric is happy to talk it through with you. So um, we will help however we can. Um, and those are continued. Yes, thank you. Um, so you do not have to recuse yourself if you will not gain or lose any money directly from the decision and you can be objective and do not believe your participation will create an appearance of impropriety. So in that case, what she would do is just disclose whatever might be, you know, an appearance. Like, I just want to let y'all know that the applicant here is my, um, my niece's best friend. But regardless, I think I can be, you know, objective in hearing this case. So, um, you know, if it's kind of a tenuous connection, you just disclose it. And, you know, if you think you can be impartial, just fine. Um, and if you're uncertain, please talk to staff, talk to us. We're happy to help. Uh, so goal number three of this presentation is to help you remember to disclose knowledge you've received about an agenda item from outside the meeting. So it's interesting. We have different kinds of boards and commissions within Metro. Like we have the Metro Council that acts pretty much exclusive, well, not necessarily exclusively. They sometimes actually have a quasi-judicial function in some situations, but for the most part, they are making legislation. They have a legislative function. And in that case, it is kind of part of the process for the public to contact them with their opinions about that, that legislation that, um, that is going forward. Um, in the case of um, boards and commissions, however, sometimes you are in more of a administrative or quasi-judicial role. And I think you, you all more often are in the latter. And if you are in that position, you are kind of like a judge. And so the concept that applies to judge that you should not have ex parte communication about a matter that will come before you should kind of apply to you too. And there's a, a actually a, a AG opinion to that effect. But at a very bare minimum, what you should do if some lobbyist has contacted you about something and you realize you have some outside knowledge about the matter that is coming up for a vote or is listed on the agenda, you need to just disclose that, make that public. Say, oh, um, Mr. So-and-so emailed me about this um, and here's what he said. And, you know, the email would be a public record. Um, so that way, there's no appearance of impropriety because you've disclosed what the knowledge is and everybody now knows the same thing. So um, knowledge can also include um, uh, your own expertise or experience with this type of issue or area of downtown when making a decision. That is a little tricky because like we all 
think about this all the time. Whenever you see like um, a map up on the screen, you know, showing an area, you'll think, oh, well, when I park at that Kroger, here's what I always do, you know. But um, uh, it, it is best to try to rely your decision on the evidence that is being presented to you in the room during the hearing rather than based on like what you know from that outside knowledge. And um, you'll see a case cited at the bottom of the screen. So we have had our boards and commissions get into trouble on open meetings, compliance issues, and, and various other issues. So um, it is um, like um, the chair was saying earlier, if you don't ever want to be involved in a lawsuit, it is highly important for you to follow these rules. All right, let's see. The next one is um, goal four. Okay, good. Acceptable reason. So when you are, again, like I was saying, like you really wanna base your decisions on the evidence that's presented during the hearing itself. Um, so you're gonna wanna pay attention to that. Like, you know, when you have a hearing and you have people come up and testify and say, oh yeah, that's in my neighborhood. Um, you know, I've seen four accidents at that stop sign, you know, or something like that. You know, it, that is that is evidence before you. You can take that into consideration. A really good kind of evidence to have before you is if official study has been done. Um, uh, so like a lot of times the department will, will do a study and present that to you, um, or they'll have a contractor do that, or um, uh, maybe even an applicant will have a professional um, do that. Um, and also individuals can, um, can present and testify as to facts as well. Um, and things that you should not base a vote or decision on um, as a commissioner are just like, if you just feel like the applicant is like super sympathetic and you just don't wanna rule against them, that's not a valid reason for a vote. Um, and also, um, <laughs> this is a bad example for our purpose. Like I said, this presentation is meant for um, all of the boards and commissions. So their example is, this project may be noisy and we already have too much traffic. So actually traffic is relevant to you. <laughs> you all care about um, uh, the flow of traffic on the streets and public safety. Those are your, your main things that you care about. Um, so, um, but, but noise might not be something that would, would apply to you or, um, you know, if it's, um, I don't know, causing um, uh, littering or something like that. You know, there may be things that are, are really annoying and that people complain to you about them, but they're outside of the scope of the flow of traffic on the streets and public safety. And that's what you're focused on. So you want to focus on those things and not on other variables. And people will have many times come up and started rambling on about things that have nothing to do with this board's jurisdiction. So we just have to you know, kind of listen carefully and make sure it's relevant. Um, goal five, okay, thank you. Understand the Open Meetings Act prohibits deliberation outside of board meetings and Public Records Act makes almost all your emails open to the public. So those are both important things to understand. So basically one of the things that is prohibited by the Open Records Act is electronic deliberation. So we've had cases where council members or board members engaged in email exchanges with each other about a vote that was coming before them and um, the courts did hold that was improper um, electronic deliberation. Um, and um, uh, the slide notes that a judge might also order court supervision of a board, that's kind of a worst case scenario, but that has happened to us. A board that I represented was at one point under court supervision to ensure that they follow the Open Meetings Act correctly. So um, it's kind of a worst case scenario. Usually the only um, consequence for a violation of the Open Meetings Act is that whatever action was taken would be rendered void and you'd have to like redo it over again. But, um, but that, you know, you can have your deposition taken, you can be sued, you know, it's lots of not fun things can happen. Okay. And we're on to the duty to vote. Um, the duty of every board member and commission member who has an opinion on a question should express it by his or her vote. Um, Tennessee law disfavors abstentions. Um, the rationale is that, uh, you know, an abstention is effectively a vote for the prevailing side because it doesn't count against. Um, so 
it's sort of like a cop out, I guess is what they're saying. Um, uh, and board members who abstain because they do not believe the law is correct are in essence legislative. So, you know, you're supposed to be interpreting what council, you know, gives you to interpret, but you're not supposed to be, you know, um, effectively nullifying it for a policy reason or something like that. And, and abstaining to let the courts decide is also impermissible because it defeats the purpose of having an administrative body make an initial review. So there's a, an appellate process from your decisions. We've experienced that when the commission has been sued in the past. Um, that um, we always say at the beginning of the meeting that you know a writ of certiorari can be filed appealing your decisions to the circuit or chancery court. And um, so that's the process. And actually that's a good process from our perspective because this commission is given a fair amount of, and all boards and commissions are given a fair amount of deference by the court when that type of appellate re review occurs. Um, and. Um, it, they, you have to have more than a scintilla of evidence for your decision, and it cannot be arbitrary and complete capricious. So that is actually a pretty low standard. Um, so, uh, you know, again, when you're just articulating your reasons for your vote, like, think about that. Think about, like, I hope I, hope I have more than a scintilla of evidence here and um, uh, that I'm not being arbitrary and capricious. Um, and, then, and then when you have that appeal, like you, your decision will be more likely to be upheld. Um, okay, can you go to what's a meeting? This is Open Meetings Act also has a definition of the word meeting, which is that when two or more members of a governing body, and y'all are a governing body, with the authority to make decisions for or recommendations to a public body, which you all do have authority to do, um, you make recommendations to council all the time, um, meet and make a decision or deliberate towards a decision. So like if you all meet and you talk about your dogs and your grandkids, that's just fine. Um, if you all meet and talk about a matter that's likely to come before this commission and maybe be something that you would have to make a decision on, that's improper. So that's kind of just like what to think about if you run into each other in um, a social situation. And the reason you can't do that is because we have to do our meetings in a public setting with prior adequate notice, which is also required by the Open Meetings Act. So um, that notice is supposed to be enough to give um, uh, parties an opportunity to be heard and time to prepare for and anticipate the meeting. Now I will say, not everything's a public hearing, so not everybody always has an opportunity to be heard, but they at least have an opportunity to be present and to, to like, um, maybe submit their comments to staff or something like that if they have a concern that they would like you all to hear about. Um, Tennessee courts have determined that adequate public notice is sufficient notice under the circumstances that would fairly inform the public of the meeting in question. So it's nebulous, it's not like a set number of days or something like that, it's, it's, it's specific to the circumstances. So like in emergency situations, it can sometimes be deemed to be less and you know, regular course of business, you know, we would like it to be you know, like a week at least or something like that. There's no magic number. Um, what's not a meeting, so like an on-site inspection, if for some reason you were need to, to need to actually do that, we don't usually do that. Um, I like the next one, chance meeting or informal assemblage. I always want to pronounce that the French way and say assemblage. Um, it sounds very fancy. I don't think we have assemblages, but you know, if you do, um, if, if it's just a chance meeting, you're fine. Um, and then in some cases where there's actually a dispute, like a litigation um, lodged against the commission, um, like either I or another colleague of mine litigating a particular case involving you or in a situation where we are very much anticipating being sued um, or suing someone else, um, then we would be able to um, hold what's called an executive session, which would not be open to the public. It would just be, um, make us basically the attorneys making an informational presentation to the commissioners, kind of explaining this, the status or situation of the lawsuit or dispute, and um, you all having an opportunity to ask us questions. But you can't deliberate or vote in executive session. You can only do that in an open meeting. 
Um, let's see. Best practices for staff, which I think our staff does, um, provide a detailed agenda for each meeting, at le ideally at least a week ahead. The public may be informed of issues to be deliberated or decided. The board may prevent review relevant documents or contracts in preparation for the meeting, provide a staff report or recommendation for each agenda item in written or oral form with the reasoning behind the recommendation and start each meeting with a declaration by any board members of conflicts or recusals on agenda items. So that last one is important. So if you do think you do need to recuse yourself on something, you read that agenda ahead of time and you're like, oh shoot, my partner so-and-so is working on item three. Then, then you are going to go ahead and announce at the beginning of the meeting, excuse me, Mr. Chair, may I be recognized? Um, I'm going to have to recuse. I just want to let everybody know I'm going to have to recuse myself on item three. And the chair will say, sure, fine, no problem. And um, uh, the best practice when you recuse yourself is not just to not vote on that item. You should avoid participating in any deliberation on that item as well. And the rationale for that is that your fellow commissioners um, may kind of respect your opinion a little more highly than they would the opinion of a member of the public at large. And so you're trying not to bias them in favor of whatever you're kind of biased in favor of, which is why you're recusing yourself in the first place. So um, <clears throat> best practices for um, commission members, just make sure you understand the work of the department staffing your board, meet the leadership, ask for a tour. I know um, uh, Director Alicon is always very accessible for all things like that. Um, uh, review key organizational documents, contracts, understand the board's legal role and some history of past decisions. Um, before each meeting, review the agenda and copies of the relevant documents or contracts that you will need to make an informed decision. Ask questions about anything you don't understand. Note any conflicts that should be disclosed or warrant recusal. Same thing as before. Consider adopting metrics for your board to measure whether you are timely or in accord acting timely or in accordance with your board's duties. I don't think that's probably as relevant to you. I mean, some boards take things under consideration. And so sometimes they'll be like, you know, you need to make this decision within 15 days of taking it under consideration or something like that. But um, usually I'll rule right away. So, um, all right. Well, that is the end of the formal part of the presentation and the two attorneys in our office who worked on most of this um, substance of the slides are Justin Marsh and Laura Barton Bus Fox. And so you can contact either of them, but you can also, of course, contact me. I'm very similar. I'm Teresa.Costonis at Nashville.gov. So, um, and staff can always put you in touch with me. Go ahead, Jason. All right. Thank you for that refresher. Chair, <laughs> just real quick, um, yes. this agenda item was actually part of that, uh, uh, the ethics training, but also including the eth ethics training into, uh, or the citing of the code reference uh, chapter and the standing rules of this body. Uh, we also just did some house cleaning in this, um, the standing rules of this commission. Um, there was a red-lined uh, markup of this that was sent out. We did have some emails with the uh, our, our commission's email group, uh, but we did hopefully get that fixed. Um, but if anybody has any comments or questions, we don't need a motion today. This could be deferred, but we would like, uh, if there are any concerns or additions, to pass those to me, or if it looks good, you could. Motion to approve and get this entered into the so clerks. Do we need to approve these rules? At, if at if, some if you're good with it, yeah, okay. if you're good with it. I mean, the one before basically treats you as kind of like a department. You have a staff and you have health information and, and you have a chief traffic engineer. So I, I really took a lot of that out. Uh, so even if this was wrong, it's better than what you have. Okay. <laughs> point, anyway. point of order, Chair. Yes. What's your question? May we ask questions or have points of clarification on Ms. Costonis's presentation before we move into the standing rules yes. themselves? Yes, we we can. Sure, glad to help. Please. Okay, um, uh, I, I think for this uh, commission, what I would imagine um, comes up most often and I think has been challenging in the way that Metro 
presents uh, its boards and commissions online and was one of the reasons why when I first joined this commission, as I had suggested both to the Parks Board, Planning Commission had already established, Council already has sort of the unified email address, right? So that commissioners are not put in the position of being contacted independently via our personal email whether from lobbyists or otherwise, you know, advocating um, for things. So um, I think, could you, Ms. Castonis, kind of make it clear at present, I mean, I, from the council side, chair, um, uh, in concert with this ethics presentation and some of the other things around unified email and what we have online, um, I think, it, you know, council's looking at that in a more kind of unified way, not just, you know, this board does this and this board does that. Everybody has their own standing rules. But um, at present, as I understand it, all our individual emails and phone numbers are still online. And while this presentation has been given to us. I think it's also important that we kind of project out to the community what is appropriate. So what does a commissioner do hypothetically um, if somebody contacts us individually via phone or email um, to make their case um, mm -hmm. for something that's gonna be on the next agenda, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, there's a couple of thoughts I have on this. Um, so the, the, min, the minimum thing that you have to do is disclose to the rest of the commission in public at the following meeting that you received that contact and what they told you. Um, that's the minimum. Um, now, if you want to be um, erring on the side of caution, um, then I would say you may want to to decline to speak to the person contacting you. And I mean, you can always also, again, contact me or Erica, ask us questions, um, but like there there can be like a um, little bit of ambiguity sometimes as to whether an item is legislative and you sometimes serve in a legislative function, like when you rule make or whatever, um, uh, versus when um, you are in more of an administrative or quasi-judicial um, context, in, in which case, you know, you should like lean more towards acting as a judge would in terms of, you know, avoiding communication with the relevant parties prior to the meeting and, um, uh, you know, trying to preserve at all costs that appearance of impartiality. Um, the other thing, yeah, I would say is absolutely at a bare minimum, though, absolutely disclose it. Chair, if I may ask sort of a follow-up question in that regard. So then, Ms. do you not then feel that it would make it easier for all the members of this commission if, you know, there, there were a unified email address that, and in that case, then if somebody wanted to advocate um, for something, maybe they could not come to the meeting, um, they personally are nervous about speaking in public, you know, there's something that they want to convey to the full um, commission that by way of public record and transparency, then they're just emailing the full commission. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're aware of that. I think I continue to be um, kind of concerned that we're put in an awkward position of people reaching out to us individually and, um, you know, there's kind of what the standard is versus what people might presume. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to kind of put out in the public view on these board and commission websites what the expectation is. Um, and so, you know, it's it's one thing if we've all received an email from a particular entity and um, they have said, you know, I welcome you to follow up with me with any questions. Um, and to your point, if we do that, then, you know, what we would say, it, again, for the public view is, you know, commissioners, we all received the email from Mr. So-and-so. Um, I did call him up for a point of clarification and wanted to share that. Or, you know, we need to have that conversation here. Um, but I, I, I would assert that we're all still somewhat in an awkward position because all of our independent uh, phones and emails are kind of out there. So, uh, Ms. Tolan, haven't we created one of these email accounts? We had some issues with it prior to this meeting. Is that correct? Um, yes, but this is one of the situations where software dictates how we do our business. So the software has to have individual emails. Uh, this is something that ITS 
um, is telling us, and I don't really have the authority to go so, above what right. they're Ms. doing. But, Ms. Chair, Custone, they don't have to be online, though. I, let me ask you a question, Ms. Ms. Custone. It would seem that with this issue, Metro Legal should set some kind of standard for each of these commissions or something relating to how these practices are done to ensure that commission members, whether it's this commission or one of the 40 other ones or so we have, are not put in the councilman to describe an awkward yeah. situation. So either the, the city needs to start, Metro needs to start issuing .gov email addresses to commission members or some other practice to avoid this. Yeah. So is that, can so that be? So I can't speak on behalf of the IT department in terms okay. of what they're capable of providing in terms of support. I'm, I'm not, I don't have a full understanding of the technological capacity okay. to do that. I would think there would be some, but um, I will say um, some time ago, um, there was a council member who felt very strongly that the, um, uh, the members of the boards and commissions should be available to the public. And I believe a section of the code was actually adopted and I was scrolling for it while we were talking and I haven't found it yet, but um, I know that there would kind of need to be some consistency with that as well. Um, I believe that we have opined that a collective email address can satisfy that requirement as some of the other boards and commissions do do it that way. Um, and it may be that they did it that way before this technical issue that Jason was talking about um, came to exist and so they're sort of grandfathered in. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, that unfortunately, like, I think when that particular ordinance was adopted, adding that section to the code, like legal was kind of like softly against it for this very reason, but it passed anyway. Okay. So it is part of the code, but... Um, all right. I, I personally think it's better to avoid contact with the public about a oh, matter yes. that's going to be something that you're going to yeah. vote on. Okay. So, Council Member and then Commissioner Woods, please. I appreciate please, that. Just please. by way of point of clarification for Mr. Oldham. So I certainly understand that we provide to the commission all our independent email addresses such that the functionality of, you know, traffic and parking commission at nashville.gov then goes to all of our individual emails just from a practical standpoint. But I think what I'm asking is, um, and I will say as well, colleagues in full transparency, I have um, kind of a, a draft um, of some potential legislation around this. So it's not just particular to our um, commission, but to your point, Chair. Um, but, you know, just sort of the default document that has us all sort of listed with our um, individual emails and so forth. Um, you know, I don't think that's, I understand system-wise, but I don't think that has to be that way. I just respectfully would... Okay. Um, submit that. Commissioner Woods. We, it's my opinion that this commission is going to be inundated with contact from the public when we implement this new parking plan. I mean, I'm already getting reaction from even elected officials. So uh, I, I'm, I, I'm going to ask if we need to defer this until we can come back. I, I'm, I heard that I need to direct things to hub Nashville that I don't have the answers for on a lot of things, but so is there going to be something standard I can send out to that? But I, I think um, I agree with Councilwoman, Council Member Henderson um, about this. So, and especially if it is a real controversial thing, which we have been through mm -hmm. the last year, uh, I think we need... Uh, I, need, I think we need a different system. And if I am going to be getting emails direct uh, about more coming down the road, am I expected to pick up the phone and take time away from my business or whatever to contact you, to contact Hub Nashville? I'm just saying there's, there's, this is not, I'd like to, I think we ought to postpone this. Yeah, I mean, if you're put in a position where you kind of have to respond, I would say direct people to staff. 
because it's always fun for them to talk to staff and like the the group email that um, uh, uh, Council Member Henderson was just de describing that's fine because that's a public record. So and any of these emails, really, even the one it's just sent to you individually, Commissioner Woods is a public record. So it is accessible to the public and therefore not you know, kind of like um, outside of the sunshine, I guess, um, uh, in that sense. Um, but, um, you know, just because someone wouldn't know that occurred unless they specifically asked that question, you know, we want to disclose it um, every time um, in the in the public meeting context. Um, I would be glad to um, look more into this issue. I'm still scrolling the code trying to find the provision I'm remembering and not finding it. Um, uh, but um, I have seen it relatively recently, so I do believe it's there and I can come back with that um, at a future meeting if you would prefer. Mr. Mason, did you have a question? Can we, the information that we provided, can we change that? Because, you know, what I've given you to your point is specifically to get correspondence for this meeting, right? And in the past, we've gotten contact from the public on things that, from what I'm hearing from you, if I respond, then I'm my my all of my emails could potentially become public record, right? So, you know, in the interim, me personally, I would like to change my email to something more like. A, a Gmail that I create until we figure this out and or change the phone number to a business line so that, you know, I, I get calls all day from unknown numbers and, you know, I, I can't screen them, right? So I'm, I'm answering and you kind of get... You're in the same me. business as me. You have right. to take so, all your calls. You know, so can we change our contact information in the interim until... So I, from, a, from a public records point of view, I will clarify that not all of your personal emails would become public records, but only the ones that relate right. to the business well, of this I don't want anybody in any of mine. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought it was a, you know, fair point. So I think where we are on these standing rules, I think we should defer these till the next meeting to make sure everybody has a chance to look at them. And then, uh, Ms. Costones, if you could come back with some information based on the discussion here, that would be... Uh, very helpful. And I, I'm, I move to defer, and I'm I'm with Commissioner Mason. I want to uh, but, my information change right. pretty quickly. That's so what, so we have a because I think it's important to have a motion to defer. So it's on the agenda next month. So we have a motion to defer. Is there a second? Second. second. So we have a first and a second. All in favor. Okay. So this item will be deferred. We'll discuss it, next, but it would be helpful, Ms. Costones, if we could get some background because this has been an ongoing issue of the council member and it's a good issue with everything that goes on in the world of technology so okay I think the last issue uh, is the multi-way stop control policy yep that's correct thank you okay. uh, just real quick I know everybody's ready um, this right here is just um, a policy. It's, it's really straight from the manual and uniform traffic control devices. Um, and this is what we send via email to council members or anyone who wants to know, you know, what, how we look at or warrant uh, multi-way stop control at intersections. Uh, the reason why we wanted to kind of make this more of an official policy is, is really to just document it for staff. Uh, Additionally, we wanted to propose this as a policy that you would also approve. Basically, Metro has already approved the manual uniform traffic control devices. But as far as uh, a policy or, I guess in your case, a regulation that instead of having a multi-way stop on the consent agenda that you approve, um, it's something that, we, that would not go to the consent agenda unless it's appealed by you know, a citizen or someone who wants to come before you and say, well, I don't want this four way stop, or I do want this four way stop and NDOT didn't let me have it, um, versus just every four way stop coming to you. Uh, but you can look at this. Uh, this can also be deferred and give everybody time since we did have some email issues. Uh, but we just wanted to put that out there. And I, speaking historically, I think one of the issues has been 
that people have come looking for always stops as a traffic calming tool because there's no traffic calming tools available other than always stops. And so I think we have finally as a city progressed and we now have a traffic calming program. But uh, what would commissioners like to do? Yes, Commissioner Woods. I think the scientific data is wonderful, but I am going to be, if we have a room full of packed parents like we've had before, asking for a four-way stop so that they would feel safe with their children, uh, especially school zones, neighborhood, things that won't, do not meet this criteria, and our uh, mission is pedestrian safety, then what if the person, what if it doesn't meet the criteria, but we, it is, it seems to be needed. Um, and that is also uh, something I want to touch on real quick. If you turn to page three and look at box E, a lot of agencies, uh, this is actually in the METCD. A lot of agencies do not use some of these additional uh, evaluation criteria because it's it's a little bit more gray, um, and and so they stick with uh, A, B, C, and D, and they just kind of ignore sight distance. They ignore left turn conflicts. They ignore vehicle pedestrian conflicts uh, near locations that you were just referring to, like a school or things like that. So E gives us that opportunity for somebody to review and also for somebody to review, uh, approve, um, you know, the study and the justification and to actually also include the comments on this. So if we disagreed or we agreed and it didn't check any of A, B, C or D, but it did hit E in a big way. Uh, that's captured in this policy and in the form that the techs use and the engineers review and approve. Uh, you used to have a, a chief traffic engineer a long time ago, but that has now moved over to NDOT. So that's kind of why we're updating the rules and kind of why we wanted to actually just put this in front of you as a potential regulation that you could adopt similar to the sidewalk vending where you don't look at where every stand is and you don't measure 15 feet from the fire hydrant every single time you actually have a regulation that kind of sets that criteria. That's what this is. So would y'all like to defer this or consider it now? Council member, did you have a question? Um, I think on. my question was just from a context standpoint. I remember right as I was coming on to the commission or else just prior when Mr. Um, uh, Haggerty was the um, administrator with Ms. DeMassimo, there was, um, who was the former, your predecessor, there was a presentation about um, uh, stop warrants and to your point chair about how we had been using them for traffic calming purposes. So I guess um, I, I recognize that that was generally kind of informational um, and this is maybe kind of migrating that um, from the informational space to an actual kind of codified procedure that's transparent that I um, appreciate. But I think um, uh, my my concern comes a little bit, I think, um, you know, whether it's MUTCD or some, you know, I, I think there is some discussion in, in public view about how warrants are set and if the warrants are, you know, does, does it really have to be five crashes? Is three crashes appropriate? And I know we want to have kind of a baseline standard because we can't just be willy nilly about everything. So I do appreciate that there are those standards. But um, to Commissioner uh, Wood's point, and I do appreciate this this uh, letter E, but I just want to understand, does this reflect the presentation that was given in the in the previous administration or how might those vary? I mean, I, I was looking at this just kind of like almost like it was brand new because to your point, like I, I haven't seen that we have an actual policy. I was gonna try to go back and look at the previous presentation. Can you just speak to kind of contextually where we were and where this is and how those are related? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the presentation that you saw, actually uh, Derek Haggerty forwarded it to me. Um, and it's something I've seen in other jurisdictions. Um, this does not conflict 
uh, but what it does is it emphasizes the other options that typically are not emphasized in those types of presentations. If you do have a school or if you do have a through street that has a large heavy left turn movement across a side street that has a lot of kids crossing or something like that, it, you can, as an engineer, consider that, you know, so maybe we do need to put a stop sign at the through street because there is a major left turn onto the side. Uh, it is putting a lot of people's uh, safety at risk. Um, it, what we typically do and what others do, agencies do, is we get thousands of requests every year. And so we go, hmm, it doesn't meet accidents. Hmm, it doesn't meet volume. No, you don't get us. You don't get a stop control, and it's and it's a little bit too easy sometimes to say no. And so I'm trying to encourage everyone, you know, to look at the things that we sometimes miss. This doesn't take away from the commission at all its authority as described under yeah. the charter. Correct. Mr. It's you're setting this basically for us. Yes. Yeah, so the charter language provides that the commission has the authority to set policies make regulations um, on issues like stop signs, whether or not they should be placed there. So this is kind of, this would be an example of you exercising this authority if you were to adopt this. Right, well, I have a suggestion. Why don't someone make a motion to defer this? So and if anybody has comments, direct them to staff, and that way we can come back with a refined document for next meeting. I'll move a one meeting deferral, please. Okay, we have one meeting deferral. We have a second. All in favor? I think that wraps it up. We've had a long time. Thank you, everyone. I know that some of this to roll out the parking program and other things are going to take some time. Thank you, everyone. Try to move along. And Captain Jones. Motion to adjourn. We are adjourned. <laughs>